Uh, so a lot of us here are uh, students and also very entrepreneurial minded. So I wanted to get your opinion. Is it a good idea to start your business while you're in school or is it better to wait until you've graduated, you've worked for a couple years and then launch your venture? What do you think, Terry? Um, so my original plan before uh, Kick was do engineering at University of Waterloo, do two years of consulting, two years of an MBA, two years of consulting, and then start a company, I'll be ready. Um, that didn't happen, um, the market crashed, I was applying to a consulting company, they canceled all their jobs, so I just have to, had to sort of continue with Kick. Uh, so I very much like dealt with this, and when I look back, if I had pursued my consulting, MBA path consulting, I never would have started a company. Because at that point, I would have had a dog, and a house, and a wife, and a family, and like, if this company goes down, my life is over. Like, I lose my wife, I lose my kids, everybody disappears. <laughs> um, so the cool, to me, the coolest thing about Waterloo is you can take a shot at starting a company before you have any risk. You know, you have six co-op terms, you do four or five co-op terms, learning how companies work, learning how they build things, and then you take your fifth or sixth or both of those co-op terms to take your shot at starting a company. Uh, best case, you just keep going, you know, it takes off, that's what happened to me, I dropped out of my 4A term of uh, Waterloo and just kept going with kick. Worst case, you go back to school, you're way more value because of the experience you've had, and like Facebook pays you way more money. So to me, like the coolest thing about Waterloo is like you, like, I think if you, if you want to start a company, you don't start a company in your fifth or sixth co-op term, you're nuts, um, is, is my opinion. The only thing I would, I would say maybe slightly different than what Ted said is I, I don't generally like the idea of starting a company to start a company. What I always say to people is if you have an idea that you can't let go of, start a company uh, and do that idea. If you don't have that, join a startup and work on someone else's idea for a while until, that, until you have your own idea. Uh, because you have to really be into the thing you're doing. Um, if you're just doing it as an excuse to do a startup, I don't see that many people succeed with that model. It's, it's kind of have to, you kind of have to have, you have to be like fixing a problem that you're obsessed with fixing to be successful. So that's what you want to want to make sure that you've got when you do your startup. Yeah, just, just to add to that, that's a great point because <laughs> a lot of people come to me and they're like, hey, I want to do a startup, I'm going to drop out and then do my startup. And I'm like, whoa, 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 no, 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 that's not how it works. You don't drop out and then do a startup. You drop out because you have to, because you're already doing your startup. Like for me, I was working on Kick for 10 months before I dropped out. And it got to the point where these angel investors are like, we'll give you the million bucks, but you got to drop out. And I was like, okay, at that point, I'll do it. Um, so yeah, don't drop out, then start a company. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I think the other side of that too, though, is, is that school is the perfect place to do the side projects, the thing to just experience entrepreneurship, right? That we can't, as much as we'd like to think we can read about it in a book, you have to actually go and fight with your co-founders to realize that that's an important relationship that you should build, right? You have to figure these things out, and it's better to do that in a scenario where it's not painful. Well, or less painful. Okay, next question. What advice would you give to a startup looking to raise for the first time? Uh, I think it would be good to have something built. Maybe not uh, anything more than a prototype, um, but something that you can show investors that is representative of what you want to bring to market and also representative of the fact that you can make it and also demonstrating the, you know, in, in, a, in something that's real and tangible that an investor could look at that shows your particular ideas about what that thing does. Um, so the more that you can build before you have to go out and raise money, the better. Yeah, so I just, so Laura is from Pout, uh, which is one of those consumer companies I meet with. And so they've built something, they're in market, and they're like, okay, now like to scale, we need a bit of angel money. Like, who should we talk to? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know who you should talk to. Um, cause it's, just, it's just hard in Waterloo. What, what do you think they should do? Well, um, how much money do you think they, they need? 250, 500? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, 
I think that... We're going to try and get a deal done right here on stage. Well, I think you might need... If, if you can't do it in Waterloo, uh, think about doing it in Toronto. If you can't do it in Toronto, think about doing it in New York. Um, but all you need... I mean, this sounds like so hard. Uh, I understand that it, it, it's not simple, but all you need to raise $250,000 is five people to believe in you and write a $50,000 check. And I know that's a lot of money, but there are a lot of people who can write a $50,000 check. And you actually only need one, because once the first person says yes, then they're gonna help you get the second person, and then when you get two, it's easier to get three, and then it all starts to come together. So, um, I, I, that's what you need. You need to, if you can't do it here, you need to go to Toronto. If you can't do it in Toronto, you need to go to New York, but you need to go somewhere where you can meet with some angels who do this regularly and convince one of them, and, and there you go. I mean, you mentioned my wife, Joanne, and one of the things that she loves to do is to be the first check. And I think she likes that because she likes seeing the look in somebody's eye when she said, I'll do it, right? And, and, and people sometimes break down and cry, you know, because they can't believe that they finally did it, they finally convinced somebody to believe in them, and that's what it is, right? At that level, that's what it is. So um, that's all you need to do. Get one person to say yes, and then you can get another person. And, and just to add to that, you, for the next company, you get all your smartest friends to come work at Kick. we'll have a huge exit, and then we'll give you guys all lots of money. So that's go. all. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Okay, next question. So, Kick, while in Waterloo, you've now raised 70 million, about that much. And uh, the message has, has always been that, you know, I mean, unlike the crazy, you know, uh, scene in the valley, you know, they raised hundreds of millions of bucks, the uh, uh, IM companies, you don't need that much uh, for a, run a runway or to grow. And yet, a month ago, we hear the news that you have hired Frank Controne to, let's say, engineer a bot by Google or get, like, investment from East Asia. I mean, is that like a, a, um, an admission of perhaps you should have opened an office on Sand Hill Road like years ago, or that you should have, you can't compete in the North American market without a huge backer or a huge amount of more money. Was that an admission or what's? Um, no, so uh, the background is, um, yeah, the Bloomberg reporter called me and said, hey, we have a, a source that says you hired a, a banker catalyst. And I was like, oh, haha, -ha, we don't comment on that. And then they're like, oh, we, had, we now have a second source, like, comment or we're gonna write this story. So I call Fred, I'm like, fuck, what do I do? <laughs> um, um, and I think the thing is, like, the biggest advantage, one of the big advantages for us being in Waterloo is we can just focus. You know, I, whenever I go to Silicon Valley, everybody's, like, talking about the new thing they're doing at, at their company. Like, hey, I'm at Pinterest, and they're thinking of launching this new promoted pin feature. I'm not sure if it's a good idea. What do you think? And so, like, whereas at Kick, you know, all of our people who work at Kick, they don't know anybody else in tech. They go home, and they're like, hey, we're thinking of working on this new thing at Kick, and their friend's like, I don't care. They don't want to talk about it. So the cool thing about being in Waterloo is you only have to convince the people that work at the company, not also all of their friends. And so it lets you move a lot faster. But the, the downside to being in Waterloo, so the, so the upside is you're out of the flow, but the downside is also you're out of the flow. You don't, you're not like bumping into the guy that runs you know, Google messaging one day and the guy that runs you know, a huge Asian company the next day. You're not bumping into anybody. Um, and so for us, it was just realizing if we want to play at the highest level, we need these relationships. And so we, we found sort of a shortcut to doing that, and it was, it's awesome. The other thing I would say on that is that when you're in one of the most important markets, uh, you know, on the internet or on mobile or whatever, um, and you're one of the five or six or seven most used applications, there's there's like every day someone's calling you up and saying, I want to come talk to you, I want to meet with you, I want to invest in you. And my advice to Ted was, get somebody to help you sort all that out, right? Like if you spend 30 or 40% of your time just handling all, all these people coming at you and qualifying them and filtering them and, and figuring out whether you should do something with them or not, that's 30 or 40% of your time you're not spending managing your team, recruiting people, focusing on your strategy, focusing on your product, you can outsource that function. And there are people who are better at that than anybody in this room, and you can hire them. And you don't even have to make them employees. So I think it was a very good decision.
Yes. Hi. I have two questions, if that's okay. Oh, sure. Always cheating, Christina. I know. Okay. So the first question is, uh, most of the companies that I've seen at Waterloo are product-based. And I've had a really interesting talk with Mike about why product is better than service. But because I'm really passionate about communication training, I created a startup in the, in the service space. The tough thing about that is I don't hear a lot of model examples of really great service companies or great service startups. How do they grow? How are things apply how do things apply differently to service companies could you, can you, can you define a service uh, is a service meaning uh, you're you know like you're you're hiring people to do work for other people what, what do you mean by that exactly yeah you need people to scale that's how we would define uh, okay. it. okay so like an agent an ad agency would be a services company or an accounting firm would be a services company yes. or a consulting firm would be a services company is that yep. what you mean Yes, and in our case specifically, we will be doing workshops for organizations. So we need to customize per every client, and that's really difficult to scale. Well, look, th there are plenty of great companies uh, who have been built over the years using a services model. The problem with the services model is that the economics of that business aren't as attractive to investors um, unless you get really, really big. Because um, you know, it's, it, you're basically reselling people to somebody else, and you can mark that up, but you don't end up generally being able to mark it up you know, 10x. And so you, you don't actually capture a lot of profit margin, and you can't recycle that profit margin to grow the business. So it, it becomes difficult. Um, to attract enough capital to really grow a business like that. And that's why investors, and, and we're a classic example of it, tend to shy away from those kinds of things. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know. There, there are plenty of great companies that have been built that way, but venture investors generally don't invest in them. How do, you, do you, how do you think about Uber? Is it a services company? No, Uber's not a services company because they don't uh, hire and employ those people. They build a platform, you know, TaskRabbit's not a services company. Uh, they, you know, they basically just build a platform or a marketplace for people. So you could build a services company that way. Um, and, and the challenge is that it's harder to control the quality of the service that you deliver if you use that approach. But, but that, that answer really discourages people from entering into startups that work on services. So let's say if we have people here who are interested in starting companies, you know, providing services, what advice would you give to them? Well, figure out if you can bootstrap it, right? Figure out if you can own 100% of it. Um, if you can own 100% of a company that does $25 million in revenue and makes $3 million a year, that's $3 million a year that you're keeping. So uh, my advice, if I was starting a services, if you, were start, if you were starting a services business, my advice would be figure out if you can figure out how to get it going without having to uh, dilute and, and bring in outside investors. Okay, thank you very much. Second question. <laughs> <laughs> that was at least a couple questions in there. <laughs> Follow-up questions don't count. So there are very few <laughs> female entrepreneurs. Uh, wh why do you think that is? And uh, what type of things do you think we collectively could do to encourage more females to enter the entrepreneurship space? There's actually a huge number of female entrepreneurs where we don't see as many female entrepreneurs as we should as in the tech sector. Um, so th there's this notion that there's not enough female entrepreneurs, and that I think is, 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 is true in the tech sector, but not true in most other parts of business. Um, and I think the reason we don't see as many female entrepreneurs in the tech sector is, um, you know, because women are unfortunately underrepresented in a lot of technical disciplines. I think some of that is um, uh, societal, some of it is um, historical. Um, I think it's changing a lot. 
I don't know, what's the, what's the ratio women uh, undergrads at Waterloo? Do you know, does anybody know the number? For CS, it's less than 15%. Less than 15. Yeah, and I think engineering as a whole, I think at 22% right now. Right, so that's, that I think is, 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 is it's the problem. Um, but at Harvey Mudd, uh, they have 50-50 in their computer science department, so it doesn't have to be the case. Um, you just have to work hard at it. 